hearing on assessing the impact of EPA greenhouse gas regulations on small business will come to order. And I apologize to our witnesses. I was in the Capitol in an important meeting. There's lots of important meetings going on this week. Um, and we, we, we do have to, uh, we want to get started because we're going to have to recess for a Republican conference that starts. So let's get, uh, we'll get rolling. Mr. Ranking Member. Good. I'm looking for my opening statement. Right there. Today's hearing marks the third occasion for this committee to consider the regulatory burdens facing America's job creators. Thus far, we have learned a great deal from the private sector employers in the manufacturing and instruction industries about the harm that two Federal regulatory agencies in particular are doing to their businesses. Together, the EPA and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, with a joint army of more than 20,000 regulators, receive a combined $11 billion in taxpayer dollars to fulfill their statutory responsibilities. But it has never been the goal of Federal regulation to stifle economic growth. At least it is not supposed to be. As was detailed in a report released by Chairman Issa in February, hundreds of job creators have identified scores of regulations from these two agencies that hinder their ability to expand and offer good paying jobs to millions of out of work Americans. Today we will focus our oversight on the Environmental Protection Agency and specifically development, implementation and the effect of EPA's greenhouse gas regulations on small businesses. Under the current regime, the EPA has emerged as a chief enforcer of the Administration's agenda for uh, environmental law. On both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats recognize the, quote, glorious mess of EPA's rulemaking, whether by hamstringing recovery efforts in the wake of the Gulf oil spill or unilaterally redefining the agency's authority under the Clean Air Act, the EPA has nurtured the distinct impression among American job creators that this administration is out of touch with the real world harm that the agenda causes. Even worse, the committee has reason to believe that in addition to its bureaucratic disregard for struggling industries that were hardest hit by economic downturn, the EPA appears to have broken the law in a rush to issue sweeping new rules for greenhouse gas emissions. Regulated industries and understandably feel left out of the process and confined to an environment of job-killing uncertainty, while EPA crafts a whole new regulatory superstructure that touches every area of our national life. All of this despite the President's numerous promises before and after his election that regulations in this administration would be crafted with careful consideration of their cumulative effect on small business. The growth and sustainability of small business are critical to the success of the American economy, which is why this committee will continue to be in place, a place where men and women, entrepreneurs and investors can come for a fair hearing about their concerns. The American people deserve a responsive government that listens to them and works for them. Small business specifically warrant our attentive ear as they employ more than half of all private sector workers and represent more than 98 percent of all employer firms in the United States. Yet these businesses carry an increasingly disproportionate share of the American regulatory burden. One recent study revealed that the annual regulatory cost to small businesses is nearly 3,000 more per employee than the cost to larger firms. The same study found that compliance with environmental regulations in particular costs small business and small business owners four times more than firms with more than 500 employees. It is disconcerting, therefore, to learn how far the EPA has fallen short of the President's stated goals. By adding to this already intense regulatory burden, the Administration has executed a strategy that destroys jobs rather than creates them. With prolonged unemployment that we, have now seen, that we have not seen in decades, the folly of this agenda is not difficult to see. Today we will hear from those affected by EPA's regulation of greenhouse gases, and we will hear from the EPA and Small Business Administration. I want to thank these witnesses for their presence today. And I now turn to uh, my friend and the ranking member, the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just want you and the uh, witnesses to know I, I just have to step outside briefly at 2 o'clock for, for a, a meeting that I had scheduled before this committee hearing was scheduled. But I am uh, pleased to uh, be here with you and with our uh, chairman and the other members of the committee. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Today we are here to discuss the impact of greenhouse gas regulations on small businesses. America's small businesses are the lifeblood of this country's economy. Competition, innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit have driven American prosperity. And it is our job in Congress to ensure that we facilitate and promote an environment of economic opportunity. It is also our job to protect the well-being of American citizens with the bottom line of providing the highest quality of life for each and every person. Based on actual results and future projections, it is clear that the Clean Air Act strikes a balance between economic growth and keeping each and every one of us healthy. 
By 2020, for every taxpayer dollar invested in the Clean Air Act, there will be an estimated $30 in return in benefits. In the year 2010 alone, the Clean Air Act prevented over 160,000 deaths over 3 million lost school days and 13 million days of lost work. These numbers are illustrative of the benefits to both businesses and public health facilitated by the Clean Air Act. The regulation of greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act is imperative to protecting public health and welfare. The threat posed by climate change is based on peer-reviewed, accurate, and concrete science. The threat is real, and preventative steps are necessary. The EPA's regulation of greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act is a measured, common-sense approach to mitigating climate change that protects not only public health and welfare, but protects businesses as well. Opponents of greenhouse gas regulation claim that small entities will be overly burdened by costly and unattainable emission standards. However, the EPA's implementation of the tailoring rule is a small business conscious method of protecting public health and this country's employers and employees. The tailoring rule, by setting a greenhouse gas emission threshold, exempts, hear this, it exempts 95 percent of all stationary sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Essentially, the tailoring rule lifts a regulatory burden off of small businesses. In written testimony provided for today's hearing, the small business um, majority, a representative of U.S. businesses, states that, and I quote, some will claim that a variety of small businesses, everything from bookstores to diners and plumbers, would be impacted by greenhouse gas standards. This simply isn't the case, unquote. Further, as described in the small business majority's testimony, a significant number of small business owners welcome measures to reduce environmental pollution. Now, this sentiment simply cannot be ignored. As I have said at this subcommittee's past two meetings, we can't have a productive discussion about the impact of regulations without considering both costs and benefits. For example, when we talk about the new tailpipe emission standards, we cannot simply discuss a potential increase in the sticker price of a vehicle. The proposed standards for heavy and medium duty trucks, despite a marginal increase in sticker price, are projected to save over $74,000 over the life of the truck and save over $500 million barrels of oil. You want to talk economic impact? Multiply that roughly with the oil price of oil bouncing back and forth over a, um, $100. I mean, you could have savings that you could measure, do the math. $50 billion. Multiply this times all the trucks on the roads and the reduced fuel consumption in greenhouse gas pollutant emissions can help achieve energy independence while improving our public health. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to having a well-rounded discussion about greenhouse gas emission standards, their costs, and their benefits with today's witnesses. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, members have seven days to submit opening statements for. Oh no, no, no. We we got an opening statement. I forgot. We got the chairman here. The chairman of the full committee, gentleman from thank, California. Thank you is very recognized. much, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. Uh, the ranking member wisely said that cost and benefit needs to be evaluated. But as we will hear today, and this committee has found in its studies, cost and benefit are not part of the EPA's mandate or consideration. If they were, many of the uh, regulations that they have created would not have been created. Ultimately, they simply say, we are only looking at the environment, we are not looking at the cost. If cost effectiveness, least cost <coughs> system, greatest pollution, a reduction at the least price were part of the mandate, <coughs> we would all applaud it. In addition, the EPA has no limits. This committee has discovered that, in fact, a naturally occurring gas that, in, that will continue to be produced in huge amounts in other countries is, in fact, being regulated. Any coal not consumed in this country will be shipped to another country. The most high-polluting uh, high coal in the world is burned in China. These and other realities cause us to, A, 
have more of this gas than we would otherwise have if our goal really was to reduce the gas on a global basis. But B, and most importantly, when you look at farmers in Iowa who find themselves being fined because dust from corn husk get in the air on their farm and other kinds of nonsensical, not intended in the EPA's original mandate, regulations continue to be produced, you have to wonder why didn't Congress set limits. Last but not least, this committee has repeatedly seen and now becomes convinced that the EPA and other environmental organizations are, in fact, inviting litigation, settling, and using that litigation in order to justify new regulations. This practice of being sued, settling, and then, in fact, producing new rules is an area that clearly has to stop. Congress exempts itself from civil lawsuits over its policies for a reason. The EPA, on the other hand, and other organizations seem to welcome those because they lead to the same end that they want but make it faster. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, this committee is more and more through that AmericanJobCreators.com awareness program. We are finding that rules that have not been made but are used under the form of guidance and guidelines and so on are basically threatened as rules, so eventually they become rules after, in fact, compliance is reached by a long threat. These and other impediments to job creation are something this committee is dedicated to. Of course, on both sides of the aisle, we want clean air and clean water, but we also want the funds created by a successful economy that pay for that clean air and clean water. Last weekend, I was on a bipartisan CODEL to Egypt. The Nile is very pretty, but there is not enough money to deliver the kind of health standards in Egypt that we have here today. That is a goal that America has to be cognizant of. If we do not have a successful economy, there will not be money for the regulators to have the dream they now mandate without a clear course toward it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this important hearing and yield back. I thank the gentleman. Um, we want to welcome our first panel of witnesses. We have first Dr. David Kreutzer, a research fellow at Energy, Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation. Um, in his position, he researches how energy and climate change legislation will affect economic activity in the national local and, uh, and at the industry level. We have Mr. Joe Rockabitz, uh, the Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association and has been involved in the trucking industry over 30 years as both an employee driver and owner and operator. We have Mr. David Doniger. He is the Policy Director of the Climate uh, Center at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Welcome you to the committee. And Mr. Keith Holman uh, is Deputy Executive Director at the National Lime Association and represented small businesses on environmental regulatory issues for many years. It is uh, pursuant to the rules of the committee. All witnesses are sworn in. So if you will just uh, stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The records show that each of the four witnesses answered in the affirmative. And um, um, we are going to try to limit everyone's testimony to five minutes. We do have a Republican conference that starts in nine minutes but they never start on time. So um, we are going, going to try to get through all five uh, of, of you, and then we will probably recess and then try to come back for, for questions. And I, I apologize, but we want to at least get your, your testimony. So let us get started, and we are going to go right down the line. Mr. Rockabalt. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, good afternoon. And thank you for allowing me to testify on behalf of small business truckers concerning EPA's efforts to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. OOIDA represents the interest of small business trucking professionals and professional drivers. We currently have more than 153,000 members collectively who own and operate approximately 200,000 heavy duty trucks nationwide. Any regulation adopted affecting the trucking industry has a dramatic effect on small business truckers. The main issue, as we see it, is all about process, how regulations are adopted, whether the process is open transparent, includes all of the stakeholders, and if the justifications have properly taken into account all the variables necessary to avoid a one-size-fits-all regulatory system that may disproportionately benefit some stakeholders at the expense of others. In this context, EPA's proposed GHG regulations for new heavy-duty trucks can be viewed as having thrown small business concerns under the bus. Small business truckers cannot be portrayed as unconcerned about air quality and fuel mileage improvement. 
between EPA's stepped-up emission standards on diesel engines beginning in 2004 and continuing through 2007 and 2010 model years, today's diesel engines are more than 90 percent cleaner than just a decade ago. On top of that, EPA mandates truckers uh, must use ultra-low sulfur diesel and, in California, specialty diesel blends. All of this has come with a significant price increase on new trucks and at the fuel pump. Additionally, since small business truckers operate in a hyper-competitive marketplace, managing their number one expense, fuel, is imperative for their survival. Those who don't are quickly culled from the market, as evident by the recent record bankruptcies in the trucking industry. In spite of all the success in reducing emissions, government agencies still want to regulate further at a time when small business truckers are still trying to collect their breath after the worst economic contraction since the Great Depression. When EPA embarked on this regulatory process, the White House instructed the agency to work with all stakeholders with specific direction to partner with the California Air Resources Board in crafting GHG rules. I suppose this was because many think CARB is an environmental trailblazer. However, many of us in the small business community recognize CARB's record as one that does not account for the concerns of small businesses. Indeed, CARB's history of engagement with small business can be viewed as nothing more than checking off the box. Their supposed leadership on regulating trucking GHG emissions has not been without significant controversy within the trucking community because they have resulted in high cost, limited benefits to all but the largest trucking fleets yet they are driving EPA's regulatory process on GHG emissions regulation of trucks. From the high tran affair to Dr. Enstrom's dismissal at UCLA for questioning CARB's PM mortality studies, CARB cutting by half their original diesel emissions mortality estimates, to the admission I recently received from CARB, which shows they are regulating transportation refrigeration units on trailers without any studies or scientific foundation. Their actions are leaving the small business community breathlessly questioning the agency's commitment to accuracy and wondering about their disproportionate influence on EPA's rulemaking, especially when EPA is ignoring our small business concerns. Based on the attention small businesses have received as job creators, the small business trucking community had hoped for more from EPA. However, we have only seen more of the same, shut out, ignored, and likely forced to live with bad public policy. Owner-operators and small business truckers operate widely diverse trucking operations, categorizing, categorizing all trucking into a one-size-fits-all regulatory regimen uh, will likely lead to those same entities keeping their older equipment longer, reduce new truck sales, and fail to fully realize the stated goals of regulating GHG. Owner-operators and small business truckers should not have rules crafted that needlessly drive up their operational costs simply because their business model has been ignored by regulatory agencies when promulgating rules. I thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions. We thank you. Doctor? My name is David Kreutzer. I am Research Fellow in Energy Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Kucinich and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the question of the economic impact of carbon dioxide regulation. I would like to make several points regarding this impact. First, forcing cuts in CO2 emissions reduces access to affordable energy. The United States gets 85 percent of its energy from fossil fuels, and CO2 is an unavoidable byproduct of using fossil fuels. Though substitutes exist, they are more expensive and cannot be turned on and off as needed. In my written testimony is a chart that compares the cost of coal-fired electricity to wind and solar power after these renewable costs have been adjusted for necessary backup power and for the long transmission distances. We see that wind and solar power are 80 percent to 280 percent more costly than coal. These higher costs will not help consumers and they will not help businesses of any size. It should be noted that if recent low prices of natural gas continue, 
gas-fired electricity should have costs comparable to that of coal. The second point is, CO2 restrictions will have a costly impact on the economy, regardless of the mechanism used to force the cuts. There are no free lunches. Imagine a misguided policy to dramatically restrict the consumption of dairy products by way of a $3 million per gallon tax on milk. Perhaps one very rich milk lover will buy one gallon of dairy products per year. This will raise $3 million, a minor amount by Washington standards. However, it will devastate the dairy industry, imposing much higher costs than the tax revenue. It is that higher cost that is the focus of the economic impact. The loss of jobs and income at the farm, at the processing plants, and at the retailers, that is the economic impact of such a policy. A cap-and-trade program that issues an allowance for a single gallon of milk per year would have the same devastating impacts on the economy and the dairy industry as the $3 million per gallon tax. So there are two equivalent ways of doing the same damage. In a similar vein, regulations that cut milk consumption to a single gallon, however they are devised, would also have the same devastating impact on the dairy industry and the overall economy. So it is with CO2. Whatever policy is used to cut CO2 also cuts access to affordable fossil fuels and imposes similar economic losses. At the Heritage Foundation, our analysis of the Waxman Markey Cap and Trade Bill concluded that it would have cut national income by over $9 trillion and cut employment by nearly 2.5 million jobs by 2035. A regulatory regime that targets similar CO2 cuts will have a similarly large economic impact. My third point is that regulatory mandates do not create free efficiency. Markets provide efficiency when and where it makes sense. Car advertisements tout their miles per gallon because consumers care about saving money. Appliance manufacturers pay to meet Energy Star standards because consumers care about saving money. But forcing consumers to buy products they wouldn't choose under the guise of saving them money either will not save them money overall or will force them to make costly and inconvenient lifestyle changes. Let me give a personal example to illustrate how mandated energy efficiency standards may not only be counterproductive, but also very annoying. My old 1993 Maytag dishwasher used to use nine gallons of hot water and take about an hour and 15 minutes to clean the dishes. Since then, efficiency mandates forced a reduction in hot water use. So the newer model uses seven gallons of hot water, but takes at least an hour and 50 minutes to clean the dishes. The combined cost of the two gallons of water saved, both the purchase, the water and sewer rate, plus the heating it up, is less than a dime. And that is in Arlington, where we have pretty high water rates. Perhaps for some, the trade-off of 35 minutes for 10 cents is worth it. If so, they can buy the dishwasher that takes two hours. Or they could have used the seven-gallon cycle that was already available on my 1993 model dishwasher. For my wife and me, the 10 cents isn't worth it but it is no longer a choice we get to make. Businesses, large and small, are constantly making choices over the products and processes that give them the best results for the money they spend. These firms are hobbled when regulations, however well-intentioned, force unwanted choices on them. When these engines of economic growth are hobbled, income and employment suffer as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Doniger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The other witnesses that you are hearing today are, are pursuing, I think, a false storyline that demonizes the Environmental Protection Agency and the modest steps it is taking to reduce carbon pollution. The EPA is doing just what Congress told the agency to do when it wrote the Clean Air Act. Congress gave EPA the duty to keep abreast of science and to act when that science shows pollution is endangering our health and welfare. The endangerment finding is backed by solid authority. America's own most authoritative scientific body, the National Academy of Sciences, said this in 2010. Some scientific conclusions or theories have been so thoroughly examined and tested and supported by so many observations, independent observations and results that their likelihood of being subsequently found wrong is vanishingly small. Such conclusions and theories are then regarded as settled facts. 
This is the case for the conclusion that the Earth system is warming and that much of the warming is likely due to human activities. Congress has never done what you are about to do on the floor today, which is to repeal an expert agency's formal scientific finding of the threat to health and welfare. And politicians don't prosper long when they put themselves in a position of denying modern science. Repealing the scientific endangerment finding would be like repealing the Surgeon General's finding that tobacco smoke causes cancer. H.R. 910 will harm the health and the pocketbook of millions of Americans. It is bad policy and it is deeply unpopular. The Clean Air Act's critics get the economics of environmental uh, safeguards completely backwards. Over the past 40 years, the American economy has tripled in size while we have cut some forms of pollution by more than 60 percent. The Clean Air Act doesn't demand the impossible. It requires only pollution controls that are achievable and affordable. So the Clean Air Act is taking great care to the EPA is taking great care to protect American families and American small businesses. In fact, EPA set carbon pollution standards for new cars, SUVs and over-the-road trucks, the kinds of cars that small businesses buy, and these will save billions of dollars for American families and small businesses by cutting their gasoline and diesel fuel bills. $3,000 a vehicle, $7,400 a vehicle for the second round of standards, if EPA is allowed to set those. And that is with gas prices at $2.61. I would like to have that back again. Uh, the figures will be somewhat bigger with today's gas prices. Now, lobbyists for some of America's biggest polluters are falsely claiming that the Clean Air Act's carbon requirements will fall on millions of apartments, office buildings, farms, churches. The truth is otherwise. EPA has exempted all small sources of carbon pollution from permit requirements. Instead, directly in line with congressional intent, EPA has focused the permit requirements on the largest new and expanded sources of carbon pollution, such as power plants, oil refineries and other big polluters. EPA has been sued by dozens of trade associations, companies and right-leaning advocacy groups. But when put to the test of proving their claims, they failed. The courts have found no merit in their claims of harm. This is no surprise because the court challengers like lobbyists who come up here on the Hill are seeking not relief for the small fries, but special favors for big polluters, power plants, oil refineries and the like. And these pollution giants can't complain to the courts about being harmed by EPA's exemption of all the smaller sources. Their attempt to hide behind the skirts of small businesses should fare no better here on the Hill. Congressmen deny science at their peril. Likewise, they buy into phony storylines about burdens on small businesses at their peril. As I have mentioned, large majorities of the American people support the Clean Air Act and want EPA to do its job to control air pollution. They specifically want EPA to do its job to control carbon air pollution. And I have appended the polling data to my testimony as food for thought, and I welcome questions. Thank you, Mr. Doniger. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Holman, we are going to have you wait, and it is going to be a while, and I, I do apologize. They just called votes uh, nine minutes ago. We had six minutes left in this vote, so we have to go vote. So we are going to recess, uh, but it, it may be a while. Um, I am guessing in the 315, 330, 340 range. So uh, with this series of votes is going to take a while. I need to stop by the Republican conference and uh, either myself or I have not talked to the gentlelady from New York yet, Ms. Burke will be back to get things rolling around the 3.30 hour. So we are going to stand in recess. Sit here, right? No. I haven't had lunch yet.